Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. Uh, the, what I wanted to announce, uh, or the, what I would ask you, is, is we need uh, some folks, one or more people, to light our Advent wreath next Sunday, and the two times on Christmas Eve, 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock. And there's a clipboard back on the table back there by the offering box uh, and the prayer basket where you can fill that in, if you would, please. Under that clipboard, if you lift the sheet, the sign-up sheet, you'll see the readings for those times. So there's one there for that Sunday and the two Christmas Eve. So if that's something you'd be willing to do, we'd really appreciate it. Please do sign up today, though, if, if you're going to do that. We would really appro uh, appreciate that. We are coming to the end of the time we can order poinsettia. There are some uh, slips of paper back behind the little prayer basket and out in the Narthex by the office that you can pick up to order those if you care to. Uh, that would be appreciated as well. Immediately following our worship service today, we're going to have a discussion group get together, kind of a planning meeting to talk about the uh, Thanksgiving supper that we do each year. Every year on Thanksgiving Day, there is meals provided for the community to this church. And it's a real community project because folks donate money to this, other uh, businesses around and so forth. But it's quite a challenge to put this together. The couple that's been doing it, the Youngsteads, have been doing it for many, many years, and they're looking for some help. But they also are looking for some uh, help in the planning process. And so they, they put together some information. We talk about how this year went a little bit, and then talk about next year. So if you have some time immediately after service today, if you could go to the classroom on the end of this hallway out here, just on this side of my office. So it's the last classroom on your left, and grab some coffee, and so just come in. If nothing else, listen, and you can contribute uh, suggestions or ideas, or at least hear what goes into it, because next year we're gonna be looking for more people to be involved in the planning and the execution of that project, and it's a very important one. Hundreds of families, uh, individuals, are fed through that process. Uh, we've been doing it as carry out these last couple years. Prior to that, uh, it had been done in the dining room as well as delivery, and it's just an amazing thing to be a part of, to be here and see all the people gather around the tables with the music playing, and you know, the punch bowl and the, and the turkey dinner, and people actually being able to be in kind of a family-like atmosphere. It's a beautiful program. I sincerely hope next year we can do it in, in uh, the, the uh, fellowship hall as well as the ways we have been doing it through carry out and delivery. But if you're interested in being a part of that or you want to know more about it, today is the day uh, to stop by uh, right after church service in the classroom where we will discuss it briefly. Angel's here to talk about something else that took place here recently. So, Angel, would you? So, as many of you see when you're out shopping, those Toys for Tots boxes. You may donate a toy to them, but do you ever know where they go after that? We have taken over for the last two years the distribution for that for the families here in the Fellowship Hall. It happened for four days this week. Um, it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Friday, they did curbside only, so the families would send in a wish list for the kids. The volunteers would pick the toys off the tables, and then the parents could pick them up outside. And then Saturday was in person and curbside. So yesterday, we had families coming through. There was tables lined, like four rows in the fellowship hall, all overflowing with toys. It's amazing what this community does for these kids. We helped about 178 families this year for Christmas. So thank you to everybody that may have helped with this this year. Um, I'm hoping we can continue to help them throughout the years. Thank you. And thank you, Angel. I know you're involved in the planning committee for that, so thank you for that. And today, we're going to hear about the mission of the month for this month of December. And Amanda Snyder's here to share with us. Good morning, everyone. So this, uh, the mission for December is mittens and blankets, which has been a long-standing mission for those that have been members of the con this congregation for a long time, so I'm just presenting what you already know. And for those that are new, um, they, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but um, as we were hit with a snowstorm on Friday and Saturday morning, we as adults probably think about the perilous roads, right, and, and uh, the extra planning that's needed to get to wherever we're trying to go or just hunker down. 
But for our kids, hopefully it means just making snowmen. It's the, sneaky, the sticky snow that's, that's uh, fun to play with. And so this month, um, we know in this community and through the numerous educators that are in this con congregation, we know that there's a lot of kids in the community that actually don't have waterproof gloves that make it easy to make snowmen or play at recess. And so uh, December is dedicated to collecting waterproof gloves as well as uh, blankets for international uh, national and international applications through the Church World Service Blanket Service. <laughs> Church World Service blank Blanket Mission, rather. Um, so as you came in the front door, you may have seen there's a, the tr there's a tree out there, the traditional tree that's out there every December, um, where you have the option to either decorate the tree with waterproof mittens, or you can donate money, and again, the, the uh, mission committee will go out and shop for waterproof mi mittens this month. Um, I happen to work for a retailer, so I know that a lot of those waterproof mittens are out of, out of the stores by mid-January already, and so we know that we get a lot of snow in, in uh, February, March, maybe even April sometimes. <laughs> um, but it makes for a good month to grab them, grab them now. Um, the, second, the second part of the December mission is the World Church Service um, Blanket Ministry. And we, uh, this congregation has, provided, has participated for many years in that, and it's a broad-reaching mission that provides our neighbors who are experiencing poverty, displacement, or disaster with a warm blanket to comfort them in the time of need. And so these blankets um, not only can bring warmth, but they sometimes can provide shelter, or I know I've seen in, in previous presentations it can actually be used to carry a baby. And so for that one, um, it's not blankets that are donated to church, but it's through a monetary donation, and it's roughly $10 per blanket if you're interested in contributing to that um, part of the mission. And then at the end of December, we will send the donation to the uh, Church World Service for specifically the blanket ministry. So if you can take a moment to help us spread the warmth in this holiday season, uh, every donation, large and small, will help make a difference for those in need. Thank you. And thank you. And those mittens are distributed here in town, so they go directly to kids in our community. This morning we have this as our call to worship, and I would invite you, if you would, to recite this with me. We've gathered this morning to worship together Christ the Lord through songs of joy and praise, scriptures and the spoken word. May our hearts continue to be prepared for the King who is coming, the babe in the manger. He is the King of kings. And this is our first song. I invite you to join with me in singing. There's a song in the air.
Thank you, and please be seated if you would. And now at this time, we're going to have the lighting of our Advent candle wreath. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The, uh, the one who f follows me will not talk in the darkness, walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. The Lord says to his servant, it is too light, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to rise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now we'll sing together that boy child of Mary. We begin with the refrain and then the verses and then the refrain we end with. Just very briefly, as we are continuing in our study into the beliefs of the Christian church that we hold at nine o'clock in the lounge uh, during this period of time, we have one more Sunday and then we'll be taking a break for a little while. But today we did get to the subject of compassion. And as it turns out, compassion is the subject of the scripture reading today too. And so it really kind of works very well together. But I want you to think about that word compassion for a little while. 
until we get to the part of reading the scripture and, and hearing a little bit about what was being said there. But what does that word mean to you? To have compassion, to be compassionate. So I just want to leave that with you this morning. Just think about that word a little bit. What thoughts come to your mind? What sort of images does that bring to you uh, when you hear that word or you think of that word compassion? Well, I know what they, oh, there it is. I was going to say I know what it said. Um, for our joys and concerns today, you know, the, the joy uh, is, is that the big storm missed us. I mean, it, it's, maybe it was bad, but it wasn't anything like what they said it was going to be. I was very much convinced that today we would be, you know, in the midst of knee-deep snow somewhere. It, it, it looked that way or something like high freezing rain. So the sun is shining and we can be very joyful that that kind of missed us a little bit. However, if you had been watching the news, you saw what happened in the southern part of the, of the country. In the, in the, they call it the Midwest. For me, it's more the south. But in Kentucky and Arkansas and a little bit of southern Illinois and in, 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 in around that area, they had terrible and horrible um, tornadoes, tornado activity. Uh, they say that the one that hit uh, an area that it basically did about 200 miles of damage, which is a record, I think, or certainly in the record books for that area, it is the worst disaster to hit Kentucky related to weather ever. So this is a very serious and horrible. A lot of people lost their lives, at least 100, they think. And, you know, uh, there was, uh, when we were younger, we were living in uh, Black Earth, and the year that the tornado, it was an F5 that destroyed Barnevelt, it came right up and took a turn and went right through the, uh, the newer side of the city, Black Earth, we were living in. We were on the old side, and there was the newer side, and it, we saw what tornadoes can do. It did damage around our house, too, but nothing like that, and the sound of it is incredible. But the damage is in an instant. Houses are reduced to nothing. Walls are ripped off, uh, roofs. And, th and we were on the side where it was the end of that tornado's activity. It pulled up and left and, and went back into the sky on the other side of Black Earth. Barnevelt was almost essentially erased from the map. Now, we knew a little bit about Barnevelt because that's where we had had our, our wedding dance when we were married. Barnevelt existed in its fullness and the, the, uh, the veterans uh, building that we had our dance in uh, was gone. Everything downtown that we saw when we walked around downtown, because that's what you do in those days when you're getting married in a little town, all gone. Everything. It was, it was like, it just, they referred to an F5 as like the finger of God, and I think that's on me fortunate, but the destruction is incredible. Their homes, their cities, a town of 10,000. Does that sound like a familiar size of town to you? That's about how big we are. And their entire their post offices, their churches, you know, their, their banks, their church, their schools, they're all gone in this town. Um, so I think we should be praying for them and very grateful that we had to put up with some inconvenience with some snow and some slush uh, through that storm, but how it impacted others is devastating. So please keep those folks in your prayers, if you would. We're also asked to continually to keep Karen Bork and Nancy Pringy in our prayers. Both are being treated for cancer. Um, and both have serious forms of cancer, too. But they're being treated for that. Do keep them in your prayers, if you would, um, as we continue through this holiday season. There's many other things we could raise uh, for your concern and consideration, but we bring our, with ourselves a lot of things. And so I'm gonna just allow a moment of silence where bring into your hearts and your minds that which is you bring with you today, what you're joyful about. You may, you, it may just be a wonderful and joyful time for you and good news is coming your way. Lift that up to the Lord or you may have concern. Uh, you may be well aware of somebody who needs uh, concern and prayer today and let that face come to your mind as well let's have a time of prayer merciful and loving God you have given us the ability the right and the joy to be able to pray. 
This is a gift that goes beyond our understanding. It's more than just good for us, and it certainly is that, good for our hearts and our souls, but it's also good for those for whom we pray in ways we do not understand and cannot understand. Prayer matters. So we pray today. We pray for Nancy. We pray for Karen, their treatment, and all of others that we think of right now who are dealing with illnesses or diseases. We remember those that have passed away, thankful for their lives, but also dealing with the loss. We pray, we pray for those folks among us. We pray for those people who suffered from this recent storm that has come through our country, the difficulty that that has created, the loss of life and the grief, and the simple project of trying to recover. We can only imagine what that would be like, but we can know that when all the systems that we depend upon, all the things that matter, that, that help us to live our lives are suddenly gone, taken away in an instant, what that might do to us and our lives and those around us. Help us to feel that empathy for those folks and pray for them and do what we can if there's the opportunity, but be with each and every one of them and the people that are responding and are helping and are trying to help restore those essential things of life that we come to depend on. We pray for our church. In the days that we are in, the Christian church is faced with so many new challenges, ones we never anticipated. Challenges about how do we continue in the midst of pandemic and all of the things that are happening and all the need that is out there. As a result, help us to be the church of Jesus Christ that we've been called to be. We pray, too, that you will guide us in our lives, each and every one of us, as we go through this holiday season, this time of festivity and joy at the birth of the child of Christ, the Christ child that brings hope into the world. May that hope be in our hearts, and may we share that hope with others. May we find a way to demonstrate that hope and that love that we have come to know through the greatest gift that could ever be given humanity after life itself. And that is the gift of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and offer our thanks, even as we pray the prayer he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. We're coming now very quickly to the end of our year, and our church operates on a regular fiscal year from the, you know, the 1st of January to the end of December, so we'll be closing out our books like so many others do uh, in anticipation of the next year. So uh, you'll be receiving a letter, all of you from me in your homes very soon, asking you to you know, be generous at the end of the year so that we can finish strong and head into our year uh, upcoming. So I wanna offer a blessing upon the gifts we receive. As you know, the offering box is in the back now, but I think it appropriate that we remember that our gifts go toward it's so much more than what we imagine when, when given to this church. There are so many mission projects, so many activities that take place that it, it, it's just incredible to be a part of such a wonderful church. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. We thank you for the generosity of those who help this church continue in its mission of serving you. We seek, Lord, to be your disciples of your son, to be disciples, followers of Jesus, to live our lives in such a way that bring honor and glory to your name. You have taught us that we are to live in this world as those who love you with all our heart, all our being, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. 
Give us the strength and the, 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 just the sight of mind to do so. It's so easy, God, in this world to be suspicious or uncertain or frightened, to be cynical. Soften our hearts and help us to see the world as you have seen it through your son, as a place of people in desperate need of love and care and forgiveness. Thank goodness, God, that that is your attitude because each and every one of us are desperately in need of that forgiveness, that care. We ask that you bless these gifts that are given this church this year and the years to come and that you give us the wisdom and how to use them best in the service of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Would you join with me? Of the Father's love begotten. And choir members sing up so you help us with this one. The scripture reading this morning is from Luke 3, verses 7 through 18, from the Good News Translation. Crowds of people came out to John to be baptized by him. You snakes, he said to them, who told you that you could escape from the punishment of God, that the punishment God is about to send? Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins and don't start saying among yourselves that Abraham is your ancestor. I tell you that God can take these rocks and make descendants for Abraham. I tell you that God can take these, I'm sorry. The ax is ready to cut down the trees at the roots. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The people asked him, what are we to do then? He answered, whoever has two shirts must give one to the man who has none, and whoever has food must share it. Some tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, teacher, what are we to do? Don't collect more than is legal, he told them. Some soldiers also asked him, what about us? What are we to do? He said to them, don't take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely. Be content with your pay. People's hopes began to rise and they began to wonder whether John perhaps might be the Messiah. So John said to all of them, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I am not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain and gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the shaft in a fire that never goes out. In many different ways, John preached the good news to the people. 
and he urged them to change their ways. You know, when I read the scriptures this time of year uh, from the lectionary, which this year is in Luke, I see a very different kind of telling of the story. Doesn't mean it's a different story. It just means there's a different way to tell it. And Luke is really writing more of a biography than a history. We have a tendency in our time to like biographies. If you go to any well-stocked library, there will always be a section that has biographies and autobiographies of famous people, people who have perhaps influenced the culture of their day. Not my favorite part, but it's there. And those who have had a significant impact on our history. And those are often autobiographies because oftentimes historians have absolutely no idea how impactful someone's life's going to be until many years, even generations after that person's life was lived. Those are the ones I like. And biographies have a specific important aspect to what they contribute to history. It isn't just to tell the story of a famous or influential human being. 
It's also to talk about the times they lived in, the context in which they were doing what they did that gave them this notoriety. So their story of their birth is important, but that's not where you usually begin the story of a good biography, although some do, but it begins before their birth, usually with their parents or their grandparents or all of those who were an influence upon that individual in their early life, which contributed to, be, uh, to whom they were to become. Luke is very good at telling the story in this way. He would have been a great uh, writer of biographies. So he starts out this chapter, and, and we're into the third chapter of, of Luke here, and he gives us a specific historical setting, which is very useful, by the way, for timing things. He gives us the way that time was identified, the date of something insignificant. He gives us the way that was done in the ancient world and does it in what would have been a very professional way. And he goes on then to talk about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist isn't probably the first person that comes to mind when we think about the Christmas story. As I've said in the past, he never shows up in any of the nativity scenes anywhere. He's kind of in the background, but really, he ought to be in the forefront because his role that he played was so important, his life so impactful, so meaningful, that he is the only one amongst all of those people whom Jesus interacted with. Now think about that the people that make up the stained glass windows, the names on most of the churches, all of those people, he said of John the Baptist, no one, no one born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. So we should pay some attention to what he had to say. Now, the thing about John the Baptist, if you were listening to the reading here um, a little bit, you probably wouldn't have thought that he would make a very good preacher because he starts out by offending everybody he's speaking to. Now, I can tell you that's probably not a good way to start anything, like a sermon or a speech or anything else. It, it won't get you elected. It won't get you uh, very popular, and it may get you an invite to go somewhere else. He begins by calling them a, a brood of vipers. He says, to, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized to him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. That ought to be a really good way to, you know, introduce yourself to a group of people and, and, and prepare to give your sermon because this is what he is going to do. He is actually going to offer what would be understood as a very short sermon concerning what it means to repent, what it means to come and be baptized in the water that he was offering it was a baptism of repentance and preparation. Who warned you? Why are you here? And so he says to them, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Meaning if, if you've come to be baptized in repentance, if you've come in, in, to, to receive what I have to offer, then do something about it. Don't just receive it and go on your way. Be changed, because you are changed. Live as if you've been changed. And he wanted to argue with them about their, uh, their claim of ancestry. Now, you know, that's, that's kind of not so foreign to our way of thinking. Don't we think that, well, we're all pretty good people, right? We were brought up maybe in a Christian church, Christian home. We've never really done anything bad in our lives. We've tried to care for people. We've done good in the world, we believe. And maybe we think that's enough. In their time, they framed that like this. They said, you know, we're descendants of Abraham. We are God's chosen people. So we're fine. We're just fine. As John points out to him, to that group gathered there that day, he says, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. So obviously we can't re rely on our ancestry or our history, you know, our family's legacy. He says, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. You, you know when you hit the root of it, when you take the ax and you take out the roots, that's the end of the tree. And he says, any tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
Now that, in those days, it was pretty clear to them what he was saying to them. They, they heard what he said and they understood him because then they ask him a question, an urgent question. They say, then what shall we do? What shall we do? If just getting in the water with you and being baptized in repentance isn't enough, if just being good people isn't enough, what shall we do? And so he gives them some examples. Whoever has two shirts or tunics in this particular translation is to share them with one who has none. Now remember, we're talking about a period of time in history where there weren't goodwill stores and there weren't food drives and there weren't these kind of, this was not common. People relied on the charity of their family and their neighbors locally to help them when they were in need. If a tornado were to hit like it did down in Kentucky, there would be no help coming from any federal or centralized government. There would be no assistance that would come from outside. It would all be done within the community in which they lived. If you know somebody that doesn't have what you have an abundance of, you're to share it with them. And then he goes on and, 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 you know, and, and he says, those who have extra food should do likewise because again, there's no grocery stores. There's, you know, people kept their food, they bought it daily and the few things they could keep like flour and things of that nature, they had in their homes and it, if you didn't have money, you didn't buy food. There was no charity in that way that you went in and they would give you a food voucher or something. That didn't exist. It only existed in the hearts of the families and community in which they lived. And I think there was something very specific here that, they, that people wanted to understand. They wanted to know, what is it can I do in my life and in my circumstance in which I live? I think this is a wonderful example of what we need to hear about today and what we need to take into our hearts. Some tax collectors came to be baptized by him. Now, you wanna talk about the worst of the worst in their opinion in those days, that was the tax collector. They were considered to be in terrible sinners, horrible people, nobody would have any time for them, except Jesus later. Nobody wanted them around them at all, they hated them, they really did. Also, they thought they were uh, working with and in conjunction with their oppressors, the Romans, which they were. So the fact that tax collectors were there at all ought to call our attention to the fact that simply because we look at somebody and think that, well, they don't care, they're not interested in what Christianity offers or what it means to live the good life or be a good person, we might just be absolutely as wrong as we can be about that person. We don't know their life. These tax collectors come to him and to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? What are they supposed to do? Quit their jobs? Stop caring for their family? So what does he say? He says, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Tax collectors in those days made their money off collecting First and foremost, the amount that was assigned to them by the Roman government, and anything beyond that they could keep. Now, there was a percentage that was reasonable, and they all knew what it was. And then, whatever they got beyond that, I'm ringing, I'm sorry. Whatever they got beyond that, they could keep. So some of them made a pretty good living by cheating people, demanding more than they were entitled to. Collect no more than you are authorized to do, something they could do. Directly affected in their job, whether every day of their lives, something they could do. He didn't ask them to do something unreasonable, simply to do what they could do. Soldiers were there. They wanted to be baptized. Now think about that for a minute too. Soldiers, they generally want to be in the appearance of being strong and powerful people, they submit to baptism. They were there. What shall we do? They asked. He said, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. 
In those days, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, when they were stationed, they were not in their hometown. It wasn't like they lived there and then they you know, worked in the environment in which they lived. They were sent to providences. And, and if there was a, a place for them to live, as there was in Jerusalem, they were there. They were in their barracks there. But most often, they were living on the road, carrying tents, and they would set up their places along the way. They had the right to stop anybody they encountered, and that person was obligated to carry their pack for one mile. And there were other things that were provided for them. They could come into an area and tell people, you need to feed me. They could come to your home and demand that you would feed them. They could do that. Some of them saw their power as a means of a ways to get money from people. And they're the ones with the sword. They're the ones with the Roman emblems. Do not extort money from anybody by threats or false accusation. They could accuse a person, too. Remember, they had arrest powers. Imagine if they say, if you don't give me so much, I'm going to haul you off to jail. Be content with your wages. And it said that as people were listening to this, they were all questioning in their hearts concerning this John. What was he talking about? What is this all about? What does this mean for me? Some of them thought he was the Messiah. Some still thought he was the Messiah even after Jesus came. He had a following for a few generations after that time. Now, what do we learn about John? Well, we learned that, first off, he has a very important part in the whole story of the, of the birth of Jesus. His birth story is told right alongside, in fact, before that of Jesus. He is the one who Jesus calls the greatest of all who have ever lived. He is the one who is uh, said to be that fulfillment of prophecy concerning the prophet that would come to prepare the way of the Lord, that being Jesus. He's not a very good preacher, or maybe he is. What does he tell us? He tells us to live just lives. You know, I'm not a very complex person. You know, I, I think what John's telling us is don't be a jerk in your life. Go out and care for people. And if you're able to help them in some way, help them. But at the very least, don't get in their way and pray for them. What is justice really about after all? You know, we, today the, the idea of, of justice is a huge issue, is it not? We're very concerned about justice, rightly so. But have you noticed that justice, when defined by one person, can be something completely different in the other person's eyes? What do we mean when we talk about justice? Well, I know what the scriptures teach. Justice is about love. If you want to know what's just in a situation, just put yourself in the other person's shoes. That's it. Your mother's told you. My mother told me this. Do you want to know what it means to be just? Put yourself in the other person's position. Imagine yourself that you are the one that is being treated in this way. And how would you feel? Would you feel you'd been treated justly? You know, I find a lot of times in all of these circumstances that come under the heading of justice today in our society, that if we would simply just look at that person and not see the other, not see someone different than us, not to see someone that is not affecting our lives directly and make judgments concerning them, if we just look at that person instead and say, what if that was me and I was being treated that way? It's as simple as that. Would I feel that I had been treated justly or unjustly? It's not about politics. Oh, there are people that will make it about politics. Absolutely true. Our society certainly will, but it is not. Not from the perspective of John the Baptist, anyway. From the perspective of John the Baptist, it's about treating people as you would want to be treated. It's about doing the right thing, the thing you know in your heart that is the right thing. because you know what it would be like if it was you. If we could just adopt that attitude in our lives today, just everybody, doesn't matter what you look like, where you live, 
whether you're wealthy or poor, whether you are powerful or weak, whatever the heck it is about you, if we could all just adapt the attitude into our lives that the scriptures are teaching us right here and that Jesus not only affirms but teaches throughout his ministry, is, is that if you just treat other people in the way you would want to be treated yourself, if you just treat people as if that person is your responsibility because that person is your brother, is your sister, if you could just imagine yourself in their shoes and treat them that way, what a world we'd live in. That's not the story of today. I wish it were. The story of today is to divide ourselves into every little warring group out there to take sides. Every time I get involved in a conversation today that has to do with anything that is controversial, I am considered to be on a side or the other person is, take it, we take sides. There's only one side we're all on if you're a Christian. That's Jesus' side. Did you know that? As we celebrate his birth, as we prepare to celebrate his birth, we are making some incredible claims about what we believe concerning him. We are calling him Lord of Lord, King of Kings, Prince of Peace. We call him all these wonderful titles. And John the Baptist is saying to us, that's great, that's wonderful. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bear fruit worthy of that one whom you are speaking about, that you admire, that you call Lord. Bear fruit that is in regards to what they have taught. And what has he taught? What do the apostles teach? Don't be a jerk. I don't know how to, I'm sorry, it's not very, you know, I told that to some friends of mine who are pastors, that I would, you know, that that's my interpretation of this, and they thought I needed to express it a little better. Can we not, in this time, understand that we are people who, of a particular faith at a particular time and in a particular circumstance, and each and every one of us, like these individuals, have some aspect of our lives in which we can do better. Every one of us. The world we live in. John isn't asking them to go to the far ends of the earth and do something. He's asking them right where they live, right in their own lives, right in their own professions, don't be a jerk. Do the right thing. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Be honest, be fair, be just. The greatest Christmas gift that we can give another human being, in my opinion, is to treat them like a child of God this year. If there's someone in your life that you've had trouble treating decently, that they've aggravated you, we all have them, by the way, if there's someone in your life who you have felt distant from or, you know, have fallen out of relationship over some issue that who knows what, sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we forget what it was anyway. Enough time goes by. The greatest gift that you can give to them is to let that go. Greater still is to express love and forgiveness greater still is to embrace them and let them know that you care. You really want to know what people want to find under their Christmas tree, except for kids. I know what kids want to find under the Christmas tree. God bless them. But for the rest of us, you know what we really want to discover under the Christmas tree? That we matter. That we're loved. That we're valued. No greater gift can we give than that to our brother or sister this Christmas. In Jesus' holy name, amen. This is another one. If it's familiar to you, sing up, please.
And now may we go in peace and may we go knowing that God has blessed us, each and every one of us in this life. We may not understand that blessing very well and sometimes may we wonder about it, but know this, Jesus Christ has taught us that God has blessed us with hope and love and promise and future. That's the gift of Christmas. So may we go rejoicing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.